Please welcome to the stage Kara Swisher, Executive Editor, Recode, Ambassador Karen Cornblue, Senior Fellow for Digital Policy, Council on Foreign Relations, and Tim Huang, Founder and CEO, Fiscal Note. We're going to be talking about um, the government to restore our trust in our digital world, which makes me laugh at this point um, because the government's been so bad about dealing with what's happening, at least this government has. Um, and so we're going to talk about some of the issues. Um, I write about this a lot. I'm from Silicon Valley. Um, and what's happening right now has been really, um, I would say, disturbing and really problematic in terms of what's been happening to our election process, to fake news, to civility and everything else. And government has sort of uh, stood back and let it happen and let these internet companies sort of run wild over all of this stuff. Um, so I want to sort of start, I want to talk about that and talk about where, where it's going and where you guys see solutions. But right now, I look at it as uh, almost an impossible situation to pull back from. And, and obviously, regulation is one of the ways you can do that. So let's start. Tim, how do you look at the state right now of, of how, where we are with, with internet companies and the government? You know, I think that we're uh, in a very tenuous place, right? I think uh, we're in a situation which I almost go back 100 years uh, to the Gilded Age, uh, where a lot of these companies, uh, private companies, uh, are getting incredibly large, uh, are touching uh, a wide variety of different industries. And we're sort of in a situation in which the government really doesn't know uh, what to do with the private sector, particularly on the technology side. Um, Probably the best example of this is uh, HQ2, right? The sort of Amazon bake-off with you know hundreds of different cities around the country. You, you, I call it the ridiculous goat rodeo. But go ahead, <laughs> keep going. Well, you have you basically have you know cities that are throwing billions of dollars uh, at a private company uh, to try and entice uh, tens of thousands of workers to try and come over to their jurisdiction, and really. I think that the only institution that can try and sort of constrain uh, this type of power uh, is the federal government. And uh, you know, we're sort of, it's sort of an interesting situation largely because the federal government currently today is very pro-business, uh, very pro-industry, uh, but interestingly enough is, is very pro uh, or anti-tech. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and so, uh, I do think that there's sort of this, this very tenuous situation, particularly with respect to internet companies uh, and the, the sort of situation and the relationship that, the, that they have with, uh, with governments. And um, you know, that, you know, that, that's sort of seen you know, with respect to Amazon, with respect to uh, ride-sharing companies, with respect to uh, sort of uh, you know, companies like Airbnb and whatnot that, that are facing a wide variety of challenges left and right with respect to uh, government relations and, and policy and, and a lot of the sort of industries that they operate in. Now, Karen, you just wrote a piece about this, about what, in Foreign Policy Magazine, about what to do about this. Um, I think it got, things fell apart uh, during Edward Snowden, the relationship between government and, um, uh, and the internet companies, when they felt betrayed, and at the same time, they were part of it, um, and then it, it, it proceeded to the encryption debate around Apple, um, and now this particular administration is very hostile. Uh, to, to tech companies, and yet nothing is being done to rein in the problems of them. Um, there's no chief technology officer. There's no chief science officer. Right. There's no interest in anything except excessive tweeting. So um, talk a little bit about that, what you were talking about, the solution. Yeah, and there's also no cyber coordinator in the White yes, House Yes, exactly. That position right. was eliminated, which is remarkable. Um, so I think we need to take a step back and face some hard truths that we haven't been really willing. And I consider myself you know, part of the problem, because I was there when we were making the original internet policies. And I think we all thought that the internet was naturally going to be good for democracy. And in the early days, it really was, right? right? It was a voice for the voiceless and you know, power for the powerless, because you had an internet connection you could publish anywhere. Right, so the gatekeepers were removed. The gatekeepers were removed, right. The disintermediation was fantastic. And so I think one thing we have to realize is that the internet is not automatically good for democracy anymore. Part of that is because we have these big companies. Part of that is these algorithms of extremism. You know, YouTube, the algorithm keeps recommending that you get more and more extremist content. The lack of transparency, which was remarkable because we think of the internet as bringing transparency. If you look at some of these dark ads that ran in 2016 that nobody else could see, you know, you don't know if you're interacting with a bot. There's a remarkable lack of transparency. So um, 
Uh, so I think that we, we have to re recognize it's not automatically good for democracy. We have to realize that this disinformation stuff we see, I think it's really easy for people to say, it's just reflecting the broken politics underneath. You know, and Mark Zuckerberg says, we were just too idealistic. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't realize people are bad. Well, it turns out <laughs> there's a, there's a no, new- No, he does say that. I spent a lot of time with Mark Zuckerberg. No, but action. I mean, I, I, yeah. he, right. They, they'd say, yeah. well, we didn't realize that when we connected yeah. everybody that bad, there were bad things underneath and it would rise to the it's circle. It's kind of a, a willful ignorance. Yeah, and some people say, well, of another version, a more academic version, is people say we're all in our filter bubbles. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, but really the, the, the technology has changed our politics. Mm -hmm. And people are not really willing to admit that. There was a night study this week that didn't get enough attention where they showed, first of all, it's not whack-a-mole. It's not coming from everywhere. There are 10 sites on Twitter that 65% of all the fake and conspiracy news and emanates from, from, right. And there's this thing that, that they called, I love this phrase, uh, uh, affinity fraud, where you think you're joining a group like Blacktivist or Heart of Texas. It's a fake group. In these cases, they right. were Russian. And then they make you more and more extremist. So that's right. the second thing. I think it's changing our politics. And the third thing is the thing you're talking about, which is we can't, the technology is not a substitute for the messy, horrible business of policy and politics. We hate policy. We hate politics. It's always imperfect. There's regulatory capture. But the, it's, a, it's our legitimate process. That's all we got. So we can fix our politics, but we can't have technology substitute for it. And so, you know, what you saw, um, I'm sure you saw this this week, Alex Stamos, the former security mm -hmm. guy at Facebook, he said, why don't we have a, like the voluntary safety reporting thing that they have in air traffic um, accidents? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be a great idea? And I started thinking about it. It's like, think about the airline industry. Think about the FAA. Think about the National Transportation Safety Board. We have a lot of agencies to deal with each new industry, but with the internet, we've we really haven't even started. Well, we have not. We have no no rules actually. No you know, rules. It, no agencies. Nothing. It's essentially just Marguerite Vestager driving Silicon Valley crazy at this point, um, yeah. and nobody else. Um, so talk about that I idea of, of of what this government does in order to 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 do something about it. Because right now, I think one of the things that I think people don't realize is one. Um, these companies are controlled by single people, like single. You know, I mean, not single. They have children, um, but um, <laughs> individuals. Individuals, most of whom never. And I've written. I just wrote about this in the Times. Most of whom never took a humanities course in their life, <laughs> and now they're being asked to decide. And in fact, left school and probably should have taken just one John Paul Sartre <laughs> book would be would have been great. Um, but they have, and so they're making decisions for vast swaths of the human race. Um, I just interviewed Jaron Lanier, who, um, it, it's true, it's true. You literally have millennial, essentially millennial, or whatever, gen, whatever they are, um, <laughs> making decisions for everybody else based on their world experience, which is limited to San Francisco, pretty much, um, or the San Francisco Bay Area. So talk about this idea of them building these sort of essentially nation states um, based on, uh, I don't know, free kombucha and free dry cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, well, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of millennials or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but but I, I, think, I think the best way to, to, to think about this is, and I just had a, a recent conversation about this with some founders in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is, is really thinking about the contrast to, to China. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think if you think about some of the founders that are coming out of China, the, the sort of internet CEOs, the, the, the massive companies that are listing on, on, the, on the public exchanges, um, you know, if you look at their company cultures and you, you, you talk to an employee, their company cultures are almost intertwined with patriotism, right? So you know, if you're sitting as an employee at, at, at DD you know, and you're, you're, uh, you're, you're working on whatever app you're working on, um, you, know, you get up in the morning, you know, your CEO has this statement for you and it's, it's you fight Uber and you fight for China, you know, and that 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 sort of intertwining of, of patriotism and, and technology is actually not um, uh, uh, seen in, in American companies, right? In American companies, you know, you 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 want to build something big, you want to fight for for shareholders, you want to you know uh, make your investors incredibly rich and and you know uh, uh, early employees uh, allow them to cash out and everything. But um, if you look at the rest of the world. Uh, the contrast is very, very stark, and uh, I think that's a very dangerous place to be uh, because you're sort of intertwining um, 
uh, uh, nationalism uh, and patriotism uh, alongside these incredibly uh, powerful technologies uh, that are, you know, like you said, you know, uh, that are that are changing the way we we uh, we interact with each other, we communicate with each other, that we it, we sort of transport ourselves, um, and that's a that's a. You know, as we as we go over the course of the next five, 10, 15 years, I think that's an incredibly dangerous place to be. So I I wouldn't recommend the Chinese version. I, I have to say, by the, although the fact of the matter is they're so far ahead of us in AI and robotics, it should be disturbing to any American given we created the internet. But they will be running the next internet. Absolutely. Century, essentially. Um, can talk about what then government does. What happens then? So we right now the only law that really was in the Communications Decency Act. They gave them uh, Section 230, which gave them broad immunity, right. which they've used beautifully in terms of not being liable for anything that's on their platform. Otherwise, uh, the FTC has punted. Uh, most of the most of the agencies responsible have punted. Where does the where does the is it a legislative solution? I just wrote about the Internet Bill of Rights that Ro Khanna yeah. put together, which is a very broad grab bag of privacy and net neutrality, um, non lack of discrimination issues, and everything. They have everything in that in that Bill of Rights. Where does it start from? Where do, where where would you start if you were deciding what to do? So so I think people uh, in Internet land. They think that we call it, it yeah, <laughs> that it was just born, you know, a whole, you know, it's this libertarian miracle, yeah. and they forget that not only were a lot of the early funders, um, a lot of the early innovators funded by the by various government scientific grants, but also that there was a lot of concerted policy effort that opened up the original telecom network mm -hmm. uh, to competition that uh, got foreign uh, governments to stop doing some of the things they were doing, so it allowed this global thing. So there was a lot, there was a big effort on behalf of openness and transparency that allowed the internet to bloom. I mean, of course the innovators and the entrepreneurs did the work of it. And I think that's, that would be my headline, my chapeau, is you go back to openness and transparency. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, but there's this false dichotomy that government regulation means the death of innovation. I mean, you heard that from the senator before, the death yeah. of innovation, the death of openness. But you could, ha like, bots should be, there should be transparency. If you're dealing with a bot, you should know that you're dealing with the bot. Um, dark, I think dark, Europe has, has been talking about this. Dark ads are these micro-targeted ads based on your figuring out your political views um, that only you see and you don't see in political context. I mean, I don't mind if they're doing that with my shoes. Mm -hmm. They infer what my shoe size is and give me a better selection. But I don't, the whole Cambridge Analytica thing, I think the reason that was disturbing was they were figuring out your philosophical approach to life and micro-targeting you to propagandize. So I think the, that's a transparency issue. One of the key issue. things to remember in a lot of this, by the way, there have been recent, a lot of hackings recently. Yeah. There's a whole other problem. Um, but a lot of what you've got to realize is that Facebook the way they used Facebook was exactly how it was built. There was no exactly. hacking involved. The Russians were customers of Facebook, and they just happened to use the system really well. Right. So again, what, what happens then if it's being used just the way it's right. being used? Right, so I think we have to say you label it a bot. Maybe we say you can't collect. Uh, in Europe, there's this idea that uh, political, your political views are sensitive data, so you have to be asked permission before they take it and they, they have to say what they're going to use it for. That might pass First Amendment muster, so that's something you could do. So there are a bunch of things you could do under the just giving people more uh, options. I mean, the, the platforms are sort of doing what Senator Warner has asked them to do in the Honest Ads Act on campaign finance reform. I mean, on campaign finance transparency, they could go a lot further. They could go further than the law. They could fix our broken campaign finance system. They could say, if you're a secure American now, you can't, you can't just list yourself as that when you, ad, when you, when you reveal that you've um, sponsored this ridiculous fake travel ad that shows that there's Sharia law in Paris. You have to say that you're actually funded by the Mercers, which is in fact the truth. So a lot, I think they could do it, we could do a lot of transparency. But then, back to your point, we need an expert agency. You know, those poor senators, when they were, uh, had Mark Zuckerberg up in front of them, yeah. I mean, it's like they'd forgotten how regulation works. We, right. It's been so long since we did. Yes. They were like, well, obviously we need to regulate you, but we couldn't do that. Could you, you know, would you mind? Yeah. And See, I, it's funny that you say poor senators. I thought, what a bunch of idiots. See, yeah, but why. they forgot. <laughs> like, we used to have, we have expert agencies, and you, you give them, you know, broad view yeah. of what, what you're going to yeah. do, and then they figure it out. And the FTC, 
I think we can say that they punted, but really they have no rulemaking authority mm -hmm. in, in a lot of these contexts. They don't have the money to hire good staff. So they had this consent decree. Right. With both, they had a consent decree with both Google and, fa and Facebook, and they didn't have the, the so staff thinking, to follow up. So you're thinking up. of the concept of an agency, because Nancy Pelosi brought this I up. I thought that was fascinating. An, an agency that would, what do you think of that, the, the, the internet? Well, not the agency, because that's uh, the yeah, Russian uh, one uh, that screwed us. Uh, I think... Ahead. I think very pragmatically, it's very difficult to to try and regulate um, the internet companies, and, and largely because, um, uh, you know, there's there's a certain level of expertise that needs to be developed, certainly in Washington, and that, and I think you can attract people and whatnot to, to, to a certain agency like that. But it they they touch upon very fundamental truths with uh, with respect to American sort of uh, our, our constitution, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, it's sort of like, let's, let's just uh, rewind almost 60 or 70 years. Uh, you're sort of in a situation now where the, the, the platforms by which, uh, you know, people receive information and news and content, you know, whether they're, uh, you know, Facebook or a cable company or a radio company, whatever it is. Um, and now you have the, the federal government coming in and saying that we want to uh, traffic, you know, every single piece of content that goes out. Uh, to a citizen, right? Oh, and so, not necessarily. That well, happen. well, sure. And and you can create frameworks, and you can say, you know, that you don't want foreign intrusion, whatever it is. But the fact that you're inserting uh, the a federal agent or a government institution uh, into that sort of uh, that framework, I think, um, uh, you know, and, and certainly we have this current administration, uh, and let's say that there's. Um, uh, another administration that that wants to abuse that that type of power. Um, I think that's a very dangerous well, precedent. Except that to sit on. television stations, they've been regulated. Every sure, absolutely. Every media has been regulated. Right, until but but the, you don't have a, a federal agent sitting there saying what type of content goes out with you know uh, as it comes out uh, with respect to specific pieces of content. Right, so they're not dictating the news. They're not dictating. You know the frameworks. You know they might sort of set frameworks around. All right. Well, what's your suggestion then for what what the government can do to restore this trust? Because it, I mean, it, it one one what, what Karen's saying is one, it's utterly incompetent in, in its ability to do so. And if again, if anyone watched those hearings, you would think that rewriting terms of service was our biggest challenge in the digital age. Um, or, or how does Facebook work? I think that was Orrin Hatch, which was a nice. Question. Well, I, I feel like the the solution almost has to be in collaboration with the private sector, you know, with um, with Wall Street, uh, with uh, the way in which we we judge companies, uh, the way in which we look at the bottom line, mm -hmm. um, and largely because that's what these companies respond to. You know, they. they they, you can always skirt around regulations, right? You sure. set a regulation and you, you create, you know, the back door to, to whatever, whatever the regulation is. Uh, but you can't, you can't beat earnings. You know, you can't beat, uh, you know, whatever the, uh, the way in which Wall Street judges your, your sort of quarter to quarter earnings. Um, and that's where I think the, the government can actually play a difference, right? You Meaning know, to, what? It could be uh, tax credits as a result of, of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, ESG standards or something, right? Or... Um, so we should give extraordinarily wealthy people. I think Jeff Bezos is 164 billion more money to behave. Well, sure, I'm, but I'm, I'm, well, just, I think I think I'm sorry. Look, so 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 Bezos has a lot of money, but but the, yeah. the the thing the thing to realize is that in the process of that, there's a lot of people that are that have huge stakes in the company, right? Right. Uh, mutual funds, uh, you know, uh, you know, 401ks, whatever the case is, and so they're all guiding, you know, their their investors and and. Uh, the folks that have huge stakes in the companies towards whatever Wall Street says the stock price, you know, is, is a result of, right? Could be because of earnings or whatever the case is. Sure. Okay. The only thing, I, the only thing I would say about that is that the government can't even stop Elon Musk from tweeting. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, and his stock goes up and down. So, finishing up, we just have. I don't know if we have a question at all. Do we have one? From, okay. Um, finishing up, I want to sort of get wh where you imagine who you imagine in the government is going to be leading this. Because I see, you know, I see Senator Warner, who's very smart about these stuff. Uh, uh, Amy Klobuchar is quite smart. Senator Byrd, Burr is, is quite good on this stuff, Senator Wyden. Um, where, where do you see it? Is it coming from Congress? Will it come from the agencies? So if you could just think, we're not going to get to a European situation where they are very, which I think is where most of this regulation is going to come from, from Europe and California, essentially, because Cal California is quite far ahead. And with Gavin Newsom as governor, it's going to be, he's essentially going to be regulating the internet. That's right. At some point. So where, where do you, um, 
where do you imagine? Where would you like in five years for it to be, each of you, and then finish up? So um, I think it's a great question. And I think what the, what the Congress needs to do is set the broad principles. And then you do need either a beefed up FTC, or when you think about the finance industry or the aviation industry, or you know, there, there's not just one agency. There are a bunch of different agencies. Our whole lives have moved online. We haven't updated any. It's become this giant sucking sound for all regulation, right? It's break, move fast and break things to some degree. A large degree has been efficiency and... Um, that's, a, that's Facebook's motto. It's, it's move fast and break things like they broke like democracy. And exactly, <laughs> exactly. So to some degree it's been, it's been efficiency and it's been creativity, but it's also been regulatory arbitrage, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And so I don't know that it's just one agency. You know, I think it's, there's a lot of different things that need to happen, but certainly the FTC needs to get beefed up in terms of its authority and its ability to hire smart people from the industry and so on. But maybe you need something like what Europe has. They have these information commissioners who, you know, they went into Cambridge Analytica. They were allowed in. They can subpoena. They do these reports and so on. But I, I don't think Congress needs to decide because the technology changes so fast. Right. And I don't think there's any reason that regulation has to be done without industry. It should be done in partnership with industry. I think that's absolutely true. And I think the problem with going directly to the internet is going to, I mean, the government is going to decide what you can say and what you can say on the internet. There are really, really hard questions about hate speech and extremist speech. There's so much we can do on the practice and just right. opening up trans, uh, um, transparency before we get right. to those hard questions. But those hard questions um, should not be, we should not have the government deciding who can say what. But it may be that Section 230, maybe we have to look at it and maybe if it's maybe really, responsible. it's really, you know, getting somebody, telling people to go move to violence, maybe the platform should be liable. Last, Tim, very brief. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think, I think it comes down to almost self-regulation. And it, I, I, I just view this, I, I see this in, the, in, in different industries all the time. You know, whether you're in real estate or finance or whatever the case is, there's always a way to skirt around, you know, whatever the, the exact laws and regulations are. Um, and I think the, the biggest thing that, that we've come out of, you know, after this election is a, sort of this, this broader awareness among uh, the sort of tech elite, right? Whether it's the founders or individual employees about whether or not the work that they're actually doing impacts, you know, the, the lives of individuals. And that's where a lot of the, the self-regulation, the regulation is going to come from. It's going to, it's going to come from self-regulation, right? Let so me meaning they feel really, really bad. Well, well that when, uh, let, let's just very practically, yeah. you know, a product manager, before they ship a product, right. let's think about not just the bottom line, the, the number of users, right. but the social impact that, that, it, that this product has, you know, in terms of society. And that... That's the sort of self-regulation that I think is going to come out of, of a lot of this sort of broader self-awareness. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.